So good morning, everybody. Hope you're doing very, very well. It is such a pleasure for me to be with all of you today. And I hope you don't mind I came with my assistants. <laughs> so we're going to leave them here. Yes. So first of all, let me start saying that on behalf of the Global Penguin Society, it is such an honor for us to join this fantastic wildlife conservation network. And as they say, it is fantastic to be one of the two organizations to, together with Mar Alliance, that they work in Belize with the sharks and the rays, to, to have been selected by WCN to start working with marine species. And also, moreover, it is very, we are very proud because we are ver the very first organization that works with birds, as they say before. And I want to highlight this, because they selected a bird that doesn't fly. <laughs> but let me tell you that they made the right decision, because I always say, real birds don't fly. <laughs> so when I was preparing this presentation, I was working and I asked to myself, what is it that human beings want most in our life? If we could just make one wish, what would that be in our lives? Well, I was thinking to myself that one of the best answers to this would be that we all want the next generations to live in a better world. We want our families and we want our friends to survive and to thrive. We want them to make their way in life. And then I realized that penguins, they want the same thing. They want their chicks to survive and to be happy and to live in a healthy and safe environment. So in this presentation, what I want to do today is to tell you what are the problems that penguins are facing to deal with these obstacles in order to make that happen. But before I go, I do that, I want to tell you some personal things, how I ended up working with the penguins. So if I have to tell you when was the first time that I heard about a penguin, it was when I was two or, or three years old. And my grandmother used to tell me very nice stories about penguins in Patagonia. She used to go with horses and wagons uh, at the beginning of last century to the coast to visit these penguins. And I was a very small boy, so I, for me were very foreign st uh, stories. It was like listening to stories about Mars, for example. And then when I was an adolescent, I wanted to be uh, an ambassador. I studied laws for two years. I didn't like it that much. But, um, and then I went to, I moved to Patagonia and I just, oh, there you go, sorry. And I just cannot be describe you the connection, the strong emotional connection that I felt when I was surrounded by half a million penguins, which is the size of this colony. So when I went there, uh, in those years, in the 80s, 40,000 penguins died per year due to the oil spills. So I used to collect them, and I had a little rehabilitation center. So I used to pick them up and rehabilitate them. This is me 25 years ago. I'm feeding one of these penguins in this rehabilitation center. And then I realized that I needed more tools to help them. So I studied uh, in the university. I was, I'm a biologist, and, and then I have a PhD in marine ecology and seabirds to be able to help them in a more efficient way. So. If I look back in time, I realize that I was always connected to penguins, one way or another. And I owe penguins a lot, because I even met my wife, Laura, thanks to the penguins. <laughs> so a long time ago, I went to, to a colony to work, to census a penguin colony in a remote island with a team of people. And I met Laura. She's a marine biologist, and she works in marine mammals. So we met there because she was working with the sea lions. In fact. She was collecting the head of dead sea lions. So that was not very romantic. <laughs> but anyway, so we got married two years later. We have our chicks, Alejo. This is Alejo. This is Germán. And this is the place, the fantastic place that I love so much. This is a place where we met and the place where we currently work. But when I was doing my PhD, we had this big economic crisis in Argentina, one of many, a social, economic, and political crisis, and we went through very difficult times. So I had to work as a tour guide, I painted houses, and I also worked as a driver to raise my kids, to finish my PhD, and to continue my dream working in conservation. 
But then things started to thrive, and the projects went very well. And some years later, we re I received the Whitley Award presented by Princess, Princess Anne from England in recognition to my work in penguins. And that was a home run. And as you can see, thank you. Thank you. I am wearing this poncho there. This is an antique. It's a gift that my mother gave to me. This is typical from Argentina. Every single stripe here means all the accomplishments in the lives of the Indians, you know, of the Indian tribes in Argentina. And I use it for very special occasions. So I use it with Princess Sun, and, and I'm using that with you today. So this is my family now. They are grown-ups now. This is Herman. He, he is studying economy far away from us. He left our home. He, he left our nest. And he's studying economy. And this is Alejo. He's 17. He's 19 now. And uh, he's going to study naval engineering. So they're not going to be in conservation directly, but I'm, going to, I'm sure they're going to have a key role in their profession because we can all have a role. We don't need to be biologists to work in conservation. So what I want to say is that, sorry, there we go, and um, that I realized that I owe penguins a lot because they allowed me to show my kids that they have to follow their dreams. They, have, they don't have to surrender. They don't have to give up. And the penguins allowed me to show them. They could make, my kids could see that helping penguins was a dream that came true for me. So, but penguins are not only important to me. And I want to show you today why they are important to all of us. Penguins are excellent indicators of the health and the conditions of the oceans. Penguins are warning us in their own language why oceans are so important. And they are telling us they are, that the oceans are in trouble. The oceans cover 71% of the surface of this planet. They are crucial for the, our existence. Life on this planet started in the ocean, and the well-being of the planet depends on the health of the ocean. But we, are, we have initiated this unprecedented age of alterations to marine ecosystems. And penguins are a fragile group of seabird species that are particularly affected by these alterations. In fact, 60% of the 18 species that exist in our planet are considered threatened. That means that they are vulnerable or endangered by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Penguins are remarkable and so, so interesting creatures. They can live, as Jefe said, from the South Pole in Antarctica up to Equator in the tropics and they breed across islands and continents throughout the southern hemisphere. As you can see here, sorry, penguins can live in Antarctica. In Antarctica, there are no plants, so they don't have nesting material, so they incubate their eggs on their feet, right, as here. Some of the species, they nest in the open, and they also they use pebbles or rocks to nest. Some others, like the humble penguins, they live in deserts in, hum in Peru and also in Chile, and they have nests among the cactus. The Magellanic penguins, they live in southern, the southern cone of South America, and some of them, they prefer to build these nest burrows where they protect their eggs and the chicks from the exposure of the sun and also from predators. And some of them live in the forest, and I guess you didn't know that. Do you see the penguin in the picture? Can you find it? It's not a flying bird, so you cannot find it. Look, it's here. See? This is the Fjordland crested penguin. It's a sacred animal by the, for the Maori communities in New Zealand. There are only 3,000 birds, uh, pairs there. And this, this bird is outside of the nest. That's the reason you can see it. But it's very difficult to work with them because you can hardly find them. They live in the middle of thick forest in caves under logs or trees. So it's very difficult even to count them. And they live on steep slopes, so you have to climb and literally crawl among the vegetation to find them. So as you can see, penguins, they nest in a wide variety of environments. And penguins, they have a characteristic is that they're very social birds. So 
they breed in colonies all together, they feed in the ocean in groups, and uh, they also migrate in groups. So I want to show you this video. This is video, I <coughs> we filmed this video on the beach. This is a very important environment for them because when they come back from the ocean after months of migration, or maybe after some days that they've been eating out of the ocean, they meet there, they hang out there, they recognize each other, and then they go to the colonies. So I'm not gonna talk, so I want you to listen to the sound, to the way they vocalize. You're going to listen to the males attracting the females because th this was filmed at the beginning of the season. And penguins, they recognize each other shaking their bills, like bill dueling, like with swords, you know? That's the way they recognize each other. So I want you to listen and, and see the video. So interesting, right? <laughs> So as you can see, this is a very important environment because this is the place where the males, they do this place to attract females. So they're very similar to human beings, I might say, right? So let's meet the penguins. So I guess the most famous penguins of all is the emperor penguins, right? Because they've been featured in films such as Happy Feet and The March of the Penguins, which is the biggest money-making documentary ever. Hmm? Penguins are incredible animals because they are nesting, incubating their eggs in the middle of Antarctica in the winter with a temperature of 60 degrees Fahrenheit below zero and a wind of 110 miles an hour, like Matthew Hurricane, more or less. Imagine the situation. We also have these other species of penguins that nest in Antarctica mostly. The chinstrap penguin here, the Adelie penguin, and we also have the gentoo penguin. We have a group of penguins that are called crested penguins because they have these very nice crests of colorful feathers and the eyes and red bills and foot. This is the northern rockhopper. They only live on Tristan da Cunha and islands that are in the middle of the South Atlantic Ocean. Population is 200,000 pairs and it's declined seriously in the last three decades. And this is the smallest penguins of all. This is the little blue penguin. They live in Australia and New Zealand, where it's been declining. This penguin, the adult size is one foot tall. Compare that one to the emperor, which is four feet tall. Hmm? So you can also see that there is a wide variety in the shapes and the sizes within the penguin group. The African penguin belongs to a group of penguins called banded penguins. As you can see, they have stripes here. The population of this animal collapsed the, uh, the population decreased 90% in the last 100 years, and I'm gonna talk about this guy a little bit later. And this is the rarest penguin species of all. They only live in Galapagos. There are less than 2,000 pairs, and they have not been able to recover their populations due to the combination of many threats. So in the last 27 years, 14 of the 18 species of penguins became more endangered. They've been, they have been moved to a more severe conservation status. And this is because penguins have particular features that make them vulnerable. They only live in the southern hemisphere, as I mentioned. This is the world from the penguin perspective. You know, this is Antarctica, the center of the world, South America, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. And this is the place where they live. They don't fly, as I mentioned before, and they only lay one or two eggs, and they take several months to raise their offspring. A king penguin takes 15 months only to raise one chick. In addition, they breed in colonies all together, so they're all concentrated in one place, in one moment of the year, so they're more vulnerable to some threats, such, an, such as an oil spill, or a predator, mm, for example, or a disease. So that is like shooting fish in a barrel and they can swim hundreds and thousands of kilometers when they are looking for food and also when they are migrating. So penguins, as you can see, they are very sensitive to all the threats the oceans are facing. And there are three main threats, climate change, marine pollution, 
and fisheries mismanagement. So as Leonardo DiCaprio said in the last Oscar award, climate change is among us. It is causing the changes and alterations in the pattern of the formation of ice, and that changes the quality and also the availability of the habitat that they need to feed and also to breed. To give you one example, the chinstrap penguin population declined 30% since 1970. And this is because they eat mainly krill. The krill feeds on an algae that develops under the ice. Due to the ice melting, there's less algae, so there's less food for the krill, so there's less krill for the penguins. But climate change is also affecting penguins that live outside of Antarctica, because climate change is increasing the intensity and the frequency of some environmental cycles, such as the El Nino. And that changes the availability of food for the penguins. And also, climate change has been producing severe storms, in particularly moments of the breeding cycle when the chicks are very small. So it rains a lot, you have cold temperatures, the, chicks, the feathers of the chicks are not waterproof, so they get wet, they lose body temperature, and they die. So this image was taken in a colony. This is a desert. There shouldn't be a river here. This was taken after one of those big storms. So you can see the river. It was very sad to see all the chicks you know, being taken away, and they all died. And the other effect is that some of the penguins, as I told you before, they get wet, and they die from hypothermia because they lose this body temperature. Oil spills have killed thousands of penguins in four continents already, and is responsible for the decline of the African penguin. The African penguin population was one million in 1920, and this is an image that was taken in that day, in that year. The same image was taken 90 years later, the same date, and this is what we found. The population collapsed from one million to 21,000 pairs. Large-scale commercial fisheries, they have removed enormous numbers of fishes from the southern oceans. And some prey species for the penguins are only a very small fraction of what they used to be prior to fishing. So this contributed to the decline of the humble penguin, the one we saw among the cactus in, in Chile and Peru, and the population declined from over 1 million to 21,000 pairs. So, as you can see, penguins are very sensitive to all the changes in the ocean. And when you study penguins, you can have a very good insight into the magnitude, the location, and the nature of the priority conservation issues to address. This penguin is dead because it was caught in a net during a fishing operation. Sometimes they die because they get caught in garbage that is out in the ocean. So all these mortalities are caused by humans. So we need to work with the humans. And most environmental problems have social roots. But the good news is that people have a very strong emotional connection with the penguins. And that helps to generate interest in the public that can catalyze political interest to implement solutions. And moreover, penguins are very charismatic. They are a charismatic flagship group of species, and they are an excellent tool for integrated ocean conservation. And that allows us to protect many, many big environments, marine and coastal environment, and to benefit many other species that maybe we don't know enough about, or maybe we don't care as much as we care about penguins. So this is the reason why we created Global Penguin Society, it is an international organization that promotes the protection of all the penguin species in the planet. We work in science, in management, and in conservation. And what we want to do is to help penguins thrive through very, this very narrow environmental bottleneck the planet is undergoing. In science, we conduct our own projects and we also support projects that we are interested in because they generate information <coughs> to lead conservation action. For example, we have a project with the Fjordland, remember the guy in the forest, the penguin in the forest. 
This is the, a, a very interesting project because for the first time in history, we are tracking these penguins um, to find out where are the feeding routes and where are the food sources. So with this information, we're going to see if there are overlaps with human activities, particularly in a moment where there are a lot of plans to increase fisheries operation, to do deep sea mining, and, and also oil development in New Zealand. And this is a project that we have in South America with Magellanic penguins. We have this system that identifies each penguin. Each penguin has an identity. The system weights the penguin, so we know how much they weight when they go to the ocean and when they come back. But we have been having problems with this system. It, it was not working properly, so we went there to check what was going on with the system. And this is what we found. <laughs> we found this gang of penguins that they, they were trying to unplug the system from the solar panel. <laughs> so you see these guys pulling from the feet. Now it's disconnected from the system, so we don't register any more information. <laughs> so they're happy, and they go home. So, as I always say, sometimes we need to work with the people to convince them that science is useful, but sometimes we need to convince the penguins. <laughs> anyway, so this is one of the, our last products. This is a book called Penguins, Natural History and Conservation. We work with 49 colleagues from 12 countries. It's, uh, we compile all the information about the penguins, but it's not written in a scientific way. This is not a book for scientists. This is a book for the people that are interested in, 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 in the penguins. It's written in a very friendly way. It is in English. It was published by the University of Washington Press, and it was um, the, a bestseller in last year. And the, the good news is that since many penguins live in uh, Spanish-speaking countries, we uh, translated it in Spanish. So we have the book in our table available in English and in Spanish. The surprise is that it's going to be published next year in Japanese. Because Japanese people, they really love penguins. So they have already translated the, the book. And uh, next year, we're going to see, I, I hope to bring some in Japanese <laughs> in our table. So. We believe that scientists, they can do much more for conservation if they can use their, uh, their science to take action. So we created this group, the IUCN Penguin Specialist Group, which represents the highest level of scientific rigor and credibility with regards to a species. And this is very important because it belongs to the United Nations. So it can have a very big influence on international policy and also on national levels to deal with conflicts such as conflicts with fisheries, oil pollution, and also a new threat, which is the illegal trade of penguins. Last year, I had the chance to give a presentation at the United Nations. The objective was to <coughs> include the conservation of the oceans within the United Nations agenda called Transforming the World. This effort was led by the president of Palau from uh, the Pacific Ocean. And the good news is that in September 2015, 193 countries that are the members of the United Nations, they adopted this agenda, and now they're more committed to protect more surfaces of the ocean. So this is a great accomplishment that will have a great impact in the protection of all the oceans and our planet. So penguins, they need large-scale conservation action, but they also need local focused efforts when they breed. And I'm going to tell you one example and one story about this case. This is, we discovered a penguin colony in 2008. There were only six pairs that started that colony, but the place was used by reckless people and careless fishermen. They would go with dogs that killed the penguins. They would set the bushes on fire to make barbecues where the penguins were, were breeding, and they would also uh, throw a lot of garbage everywhere. So what we did is we worked with the landowners, with the government, and with members of the community, and we managed to get the designation of this place as a wildlife reserve. So that allowed us to protect this colony so the colony could thrive. So remember, we had six pairs in 2008, and last year we went together with Carol Gattery, a WCN volunteer. She came to visit us. We censored the colony together with her husband as well, <laughs> and guess how many we counted? 1,800 pairs. So that's, thank you, Carol, <laughs> for the effort. 
So this is fantastic because you can see the concrete action, the concrete result of a, of a, a tangible result of, a, of an action. And from six to almost 2,000, and the colony will continue to grow. So this is great. And this is also great for ecotourism because they generate revenues for the local economies. So if you like that story, wait to hear this one. We've been working for three years to prepare a nom the nomination forms to submit <coughs> to UNESCO designated as a biosphere reserve called Patagonia Azul, Blue Patagonia. And the good news is that in, the, in Paris, the committee met, and last year they approved this nomination and they created this area. This is the largest biosphere reserve in Argentina. It's got a size of 7.7 .7 million acres, which is similar to the size of Belgium or roughly the size of Maryland. So for the ones that are familiar with the region, this is, the, this is Chile, this is all Argentina, you have Buenos Aires here, this is Uruguay. So you can see the size of this. Mm? And it's the biosphere reserve that protects, that uh, has the biggest uh, proportion of ocean surface in Argentina. The good news about this is that it includes 20 colonies of Magellanic penguins that represents 40% of the global population of these species. But they protect, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But they protect many other species. The entire population of this endemic flightless duck lives into the biosphere reserve. This biosphere reserve also protects 67 species of seabirds, 65 species of terrestrial birds, including this endemic lesser rhea that is common in Patagonia, more than 30 species of terrestrial mammals, including this endemic Patagonian hare, which is a very strange animal, <laughs> 60, uh, 36 species of marine mammals, <laughs> including the southern right whales, killer whales, and the southern elephant seal. So, I could realize that you like the previous story, but this is the icing of the cake. <laughs> this is Punta Tombo. This is the largest Magellanic penguin colony in the planet. The colony has been declining 25% since the late 80s. And this is because the adults were fishing further offshore in order to get food to feed their chicks. So this, we had information because there are, we work with colleagues that collect information. And this graph shows us the age of the chicks and <clears throat> when do they start? How many of them starve to death? And this information is showing us that starvation is the main cause of mortality for the chicks. And the important thing here is to see that most of them, they die from starvation when they are less than one month old. So this information is useful to say, OK, we need to protect the area where they feed, where the food is, when the chicks are small. And we also had information showing us where protection is needed. So this is Argentina. This is the place. This is Punta Tombo. And these bluish areas, they show you the areas used by the adults to look for food to feed the chicks. So this is useful to say, OK, we need a protection there. And uh, we have had this information for 15, day, 15 years, more or less, and we have never been able to garner enough political support to make this happen. But suddenly, the stars and the planets aligned, <laughs> and we received the visit of uh, one of our partners from Club Penguin Disney Conservation Fund that belongs to the Walt Disney Company. And the governor learned about that. So he wanted a meeting with them. And so we went to this meeting, and together with the Disney people, they allowed us to, inf we could inform the governor about this situation. And <clears throat> together we encouraged the, the governor to promote the designation of a marine protected area for this area, for, this, for Punta Tombo. So this meeting triggered the, um, the creation of the two large protected areas that I mentioned before, the marine protected area for Tombo and the biosphere reserve. So I want to thank personally Nicole Rastad, who is here, who was one of the persons from Disney that came and triggered this meeting, and he's in the audience here. So I want to thank you. <laughs> and I want to say, never underestimate the power of Mickey Mouse. So 
we, are very, we also have an educational program, and we are very, very strong about this educational program. We want to reach the communities and the kids and also the international audience with our findings and with our conservation message. So we do different activities. We participate in documentary films. We have presence in international and national media. We also help to design interpretation centers. So when people go visit as tourists a colony, it's not a funny, only a funny experience. So they learn a lot. It's an educational experience, and they go back home with, with a conservation message. We also created this poster that <clears throat> includes all the penguin species in the world, the conservation status, and also the population size for all the species. And this poster is available in our table also. And we printed this book, which is an educational book called Mensajeros del Mar. It's in Spanish. It's in the table. We give a book for every kid that participate in our educational program. And the highlight of our edu educational program is when we take kids and communities that live close to the penguins to visit them for the first time. This is normal in countries like my country, like in Argentina or others. So, because most of them, they live half an hour half from the penguins. They've never visited them. So we want the kids and the communities to know them, value them, because these kids are going to be the ones that are going to decide about the future of these penguins. So I want to show you a video that Disney put together and that reflects this activity with the kids. It's in Spanish, but it's subtitled. Los proyectos ya comenzaron. Gracias a tu compromiso, Global Penguin Society está organizando diferentes actividades para que los chicos conozcan un poco más sobre la vida de los pingüinos. Realizan visitas guiadas, talleres y charlas, donde lo más importante es tomar conciencia sobre el cuidado del medio ambiente. Tu compromiso se convirtió en realidad. El cambio comienza por vos. El momento es ahora. I love this one. So the change begins with you. Time is now. That is an important message. And the great thing is that they've been able to capture the essence of, this, of our program. We love kids. We love communities. We love penguins. And they put it all together. So this is what we do with our educational program. So in this presentation, I showed you how the penguin conservation status foreshadows the urgent need to protect the oceans and the coast that enrich our lives and our livelihoods. And from the Global Penguin Society, we are, we are working at many different levels, from communities to the United Nations, to address the main problems that penguins are facing and to lead, to give a direction in this challenge. So this year, we are going to work more to create more protected areas, not only in the ocean, but also on land to protect the places where they nest. And we have just created a working group. So we are going to assess the magnitude and the nature of the illegal trade of penguins, because we have been receiving a lot of denounces from many countries about this issue. So basically, our dream is to ensure a future for the penguins. And it is with your help that we can go so much further. It is with, with your help that we can reach more communities and more kids with our conservation message. It is only with your help and your support that we can include more areas in our work and protect more colonies and benefit more penguins. So it is your support that allows us to take action and to raise our voice about the main conservation issues that we all care about and that they are critical for the penguins, for the people, but for the entire planet. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.